Good evening, I'm Adrian Arsenault. Andrew is away tonight. New guidance if you're waiting for a second dose of AstraZeneca. An mRNA vaccine should now be offered as a second dose. Plus some reassurance if you've already had to. Also tonight, what's in a statue? Sir John A. Macdonald's divided hometown votes to remove one. This is by far the most divisive, polarizing issue that I've seen. Supreme Court precedent, a person of color will have a seat. He brings something extra to the court because of those lived experiences. And as offices reopen, will workers come back? I think I'll be at, the, at home probably two to three times a week. But is there a price for flexibility? This is The National. Canada's independent vaccine advisory body says that when it comes to both the first and second COVID-19 vaccine doses, Pfizer and Moderna are preferred. The National Advisory Committee on Immunization says that while AstraZeneca offers good protection, it now recommends provinces prioritize the mRNA vaccines, even for those who had AstraZeneca as their first dose, and many have, almost 2.2 million people. Christine Birak explains today's development and why those people should not be worried. There's new advice, but Charlotte Engel's second AstraZeneca shot is already booked. I'm not surprised with the confusion because every two days the whole, you know, the plan changes. The National Advisory Committee on Immunization, or NACI, says an mRNA vaccine is now preferred as the second dose following AstraZeneca. The risk Health of officials went even further. An mRNA vaccine should now be offered as a second dose. Canada's chief public health officer says there are no new safety risks related to the AstraZeneca vaccine. But early data from several European studies suggests people who received AstraZeneca as their first dose and the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine as their second show a significantly stronger immune response than those who received AstraZeneca on both. But people who did get two shots of AstraZeneca should still feel confident. Rest assured that the vaccine they received provides good protection against infection and very good protection against severe disease and hospitalization. They're quite clear in the statement that that's not, that, that is preferred, it's not essential. If you want to get a second dose, AstraZeneca, it's okay. But there isn't much AstraZeneca left. More than 2 million Canadians have now received at least one shot and are waiting for boosters. Federal officials say there are only about 600,000 AstraZeneca doses left in the country. Doctors say either way, get that second shot. If it protects you, you know, 78% of the time instead of 83% of the time, don't delay second doses, don't make second doses more difficult because you're unwilling to interchange vaccines. I'm just going with whatever I get and crossing my fingers. Experts say more studies on mixing and matching vaccines are coming and the advice could change yet again. But right now, one thing is clear. As more Canadians get vaccinated, COVID cases are dropping. Christine Virac, CBC News, Toronto. Now, AstraZeneca has not been officially approved in the U.S. And today, an indication that that may have an impact on some Canadians wanting to travel there. Rafi Bujikanian looks into that. James Hewitt is ready to see more than his front porch, including the spiritual retreat in the United States that used to be an annual Last tradition. Looking very forward to seeing friends from around the world this year. Hewitt got a double dose of AstraZeneca, a vaccine not approved by U.S. regulators. And that fact may have repercussions for Canadians. My father was my hero. Take New York's Broadway as one example, and use today that the 1.7 million Canadians who got AstraZeneca won't be welcome at a Bruce Springsteen stage revival. I wanted to be able to be a critical voice. Only those fully vaccinated with U.S. Food and Drug Administration approved vaccines can attend. Decisions about reopening the border are still to come, so other impacts aren't yet known. Public health messaging was the first shot available to you is the best shot. This Winnipeg City Councillor has no regrets about getting AstraZeneca. He mixed it up for his second jab, receiving Pfizer, leaving him with questions too. 
we already have early plans uh, to go to Hawaii next winter. So, you know, looking forward to those things and, you know, a little bit of curi you know, a little bit of worry that, you know, we may be blocked from doing certain things. MRNA but for now, public health officials have more travel advice than answers. Talks with the U.S. are still ongoing. You're going to have to be a bit patient and do some research. Guidance from the U.S. Centers for Disease Control itself suggests letting people with two doses of vaccines not approved in the U.S. resume normal activities. But in the absence of clear directives, show venues are putting in their own restrictions. Rafi Mujikanian, CBC News, Ottawa. And on that travel note, we're learning new details tonight about a federal vaccine certification plan that's in the works for Canadian travelers. Ashley Burke, you've been following the story. So what do we know so far? Well, Adrian, CBC News has confirmed that the government is rolling out the first phase of this program early next month. That means if you're traveling abroad and you're on your way home to Canada, you'll be able to upload proof of vaccination into an app known as ArriveCan. That's all before going through customs. And so what, why is that particular step important? It paves the way for the government to start easing travel restrictions. The health minister has said that fully vaccinated Canadians will no longer have to stay at quarantine hotels soon. The prime minister met with premiers tonight, many of whom called for a vaccine passport. A senior government source said that much of tonight's meeting was centered around the next steps to reopen the border. And one thing they all agree on, being fully vaccinated is the key. All right, Ashley Burke in Ottawa. Thank you, Ashley. Thank you. Canada expects to receive a record number of Moderna vaccine doses this week, including a surprise top-up just announced today. We will be receiving one million doses of additional Moderna vaccines to arrive this evening. This extra shipment is part of the Biden administration's broader vaccine donation strategy. In effect, it's a grant and won't cost Canada anything extra. And it comes at a pretty good time after Pfizer announced it will deliver fewer doses than expected in early July. Now, Kingston, Ontario, has long been proud of its connection to Sir John A. Macdonald, but now the city is taking a major monument to the father of Confederation down. Travis Danraz shows us that decision has divided Kingston between those who see history being cancelled and those who see it finally being reckoned with. It is a, a representation of a disrespect to glorify someone who has created so much pain. What is under this blood red sheet is no source of pride for Natasha Stritt, a monument to Canada's first prime minister on a pedestal in the nation's first capital. Tomorrow, the likeness of Sir John A. Macdonald will be gone. A statue is not so much a place of learning so much as it is like a representation or a glorification of a particular figure. Right. So I think that the city doing that is a goodwill gesture to Indigenous people. I implore council. Kingston City Council voted last night to move the statue into storage and eventually to the cemetery where he is buried. Even there, signs of his complicated legacy. In the 1870s, MacDonald let hundreds of Plains Cree die of famine. He also played a key role in implementing the residential school system. In my tenure as mayor, this is by far the most divisive, polarizing issue that I've seen. Kingston's mayor voted in favor of removing the statue, saying he's proud of some parts of McDonald's history, but not all of it. The name of McDonald is all over the city. We've understood it as an opportunity for education, that every, that every visitor, every school group, every tourist and every resident when they're here in Kingston, would have an opportunity to learn the good and the bad of McDonald's legacy. In a city wrapped in McDonald's name, from schools to trains, opinions on the statue's removal are mixed. I have a real issue with it. It's part of our history. He's our first prime minister. He's one of the architects of this country. We just have to choose where we, who we appreciate, you know, and uh, who we... I think who we respect or admire, like I don't learn history from statues, I learn it from books. And what they don't understand. Resident Marco Farrell says the statue's removal is an example of cancel culture run amok. And therefore we need to erase them. And everybody suddenly gets on this bandwagon. It's ridiculous. There comes a point where you have to say no. So Travis, what happens next? How is this statue coming down? Well, Adrian, as dawn breaks here in the city of Kingston tomorrow, municipal crews will arrive to remove the two-ton monument, and it could take several hours. As you can see around me, people have been gathered in this park for days waiting for that moment. It will be controversial. It will be historic, much like the legacy of Sir John A. Macdonald. Adrian? All right, Travis, this is your first file for the National Welcome 
to the team. That's Travis Danraj in Kingston tonight. While we're talking about history, it was more than a century before the first woman was appointed to the Supreme Court of Canada. The first person of colour? We're still waiting. But as Olivia Stefanovic explains, probably not much longer. On Canada's highest bench, no person of colour has ever worn a scarlet robe. But if his nomination goes through, Mahmoud Jamal could change that. Well, it's about time. <laughs> Legal advocates say he will bring a critical perspective as justices prepare to rule on more cases involving systemic racism. He brings something extra to the court because of those lived experiences. We know from just looking at case law that individuals who come before the court often feel that they're not being uh, tried fairly because often they'll find the entire courtroom to be Caucasian and white. Born in Nairobi, Kenya to an Indian family, Jamal moved from the UK to Canada. In his questionnaire for the top job, he says he experienced discrimination as a fact of daily life. And growing up, was taunted and harassed because of his name, religion, or skin color. When judges reflect the makeup of society, this builds public confidence in the justice system. Jamal brings decades of experience as an advocate and scholar. The Ontario Appeal Court Justice is also bilingual, a new requirement some say creates unnecessary barriers. It's clear that the bilingual requirement is a very material obstacle to Indigenous candidates serving on the Supreme Court of Canada. Jamal will replace Justice Rosalia Bella, leaving the bench with fewer women. This is not ending now. We need to ensure that we have an Indigenous appointment and we need to continue to ensure that the court reflects a gender balance. It's impossible to be perfect, but this is one step in the right direction. Jamal will have to answer questions before the House Justice Committee about the selection process before he's officially appointed. Olivia Stefanovic, CBC News, Ottawa. Police conduct hundreds of no-knock entries every year in Canada. They are the stuff of nightmares. Heavily armed officers barging into your home. And sometimes they get it wrong, which is why an Alberta couple is telling their story to the CBC's Judy Tripp. Joshua Bennett and his partner Jennifer Hacker can't outrun the trauma they experienced more than a year after their home was raided. And all of a sudden you heard all these bang, bang, bang. It sounded like we were being shot at. And it was tear gas that they were shooting into our house. Last April, just before sunrise, RCMP and Calgary police descended on the property the couple was renting just outside Calgary. Police shot tear gas through the windows. Photos show the chemical stains. Then Bennett saw an armored vehicle ram the house. And we were coming out of the bedroom through the hallway, heading towards the doors, and a battering ram came through the living room window and just about hit Jennifer in the head. I had Bennett and Hacker don't have criminal records, yet police suspected they operated a stash house for drugs. But after turning their house inside out, police found nothing. Their landlord is still making repairs a year after the raid. Glenn Burgess is seeking more than $50,000 in damages from police. When they do things like this and don't own it, they don't have any form of responsibility, it really makes it hard for somebody like myself to have any respect for the police. Alert, Alberta's Special Organized Crime Unit says the search warrant was authorized by a provincial judge. Court documents show that police relied on a tip from a paid informant and that Bennett was photographed leaving the home of a suspected drug dealer. After reviewing the case, a criminal defense lawyer says the evidence is flimsy. First of all, the tip isn't compelling. Uh, second of all, the degree to which it's corroborated is extremely limited. Hundreds of no-knock entries happen across Canada each year. Police don't track how many raids result in no charges or how many violate charter rights. Ultimately, it's citizens who pay the price. I've been diagnosed with PTSD. You can't leave people like this. So Judy, no apology for Joshua Bennett and Jennifer Hacker. Is one ever coming? 
No, no apology at all. In fact, uh, the couple asked for access to victim services so they could get trauma counseling, but we're told that they aren't victims of crime, so they don't qualify. Meanwhile, they're seeking financial compensation from both the RCMP and Calgary Police. But RCMP say Calgary Police led the investigation. Go to them. Calgary Police say, oh, it's a provincial jurisdiction. Meanwhile, Alberta's Justice Minister is declining to comment. Adrian. What a mess. Judy Trin in Ottawa tonight. Thank you, Judy. You're welcome. A Montreal-based company is being sued in the U.S. by dozens of women who say they are victims of sexual abuse. MindGeeks owns one of the most visited websites in the world, Pornhub. Alison Northcott looks at the allegations and the response. 34 women's stories are included in the latest lawsuit against the Montreal company behind Pornhub. One of the plaintiffs, we agreed not to identify, says she found explicit videos of herself, including sexual assault, uploaded to the site without her consent. I don't trust anybody. And it's really hard to establish healthy friendships and even family relationships when people look at you and think that you are what they see on the internet. The lawyer behind the suit says he wants accountability. We also want to obviously vindicate uh, our plaintiffs, get them compensation and, uh, and protection in terms of making sure that their images are not, are not exploited any further. The lawsuit alleges the company is run exactly like an organized crime family, a classic criminal enterprise carried out through wide-ranging criminal activities, including human trafficking, child pornography and money laundering. None of the allegations have been proven in court. In a statement, Pornhub said allegations it is a criminal enterprise that traffics women and is run like the Sopranos are utterly absurd, completely reckless and categorically false. We found a pattern of corporate negligence on the part of Pornhub MindGeek. Here in Canada, the House of Commons Ethics Committee is recommending online companies be held liable when non-consensual videos are uploaded. Their claims of corporate accountability simply did not stand up. The government says it's preparing legislation to set up a regulator to put in place new rules. The lawyer behind the lawsuit says he hopes his legal action sends a message to the whole industry. Pornhub says it has zero tolerance for illegal content and that it takes complaints of abuse of its platform seriously. Alison Northcott, CBC News, Montreal. We need to clarify a detail in a story we had on Sunday's National. It was about the death of RCMP Constable Shelby Patton. A report included an interview with a man who said he was an eyewitness to the events that led to the officer's death. He said the constable's gun was unholstered. The RCMP have since interviewed the man and told CBC News it had doubts about what he told a reporter. The man has now admitted he fabricated his account. After a year of intense racial divisions in the U.S., Democrats and Republicans brought in a new national holiday. Juneteenth marks the end of enslavement of black Americans. But as Chris Reyes explains, some say it has to be just a beginning. A gesture of gratitude, a moment of symbolism. President Joe Biden handing over the pen that made Juneteenth an official holiday to 94-year-old Opal Lee. Lee is from Texas, the very state where the last enslaved black people were freed on June 19, 1865, marking the very first Juneteenth celebration. Over the course of decades, she's made it her mission to see that this day came. Lee was surrounded by the lawmakers who passed the Juneteenth Act this week with support from both sides of the aisle. I see the advocates, the activists, the leaders, who have been calling for this day for so long. But I think this will go down for me. It's one of the greatest honors I will have had as president, not because I did it, you did it. Democrats and Republicans. Ring with the harmonies. Earlier in the day, members of the U.S. Congress sang Lift Every Voice and Sing, also known as the Black National Anthem. One of the most momentous events in our history finally takes its official place of honor in our nation. Not everyone is celebrating, some calling the declaration offensive without any action on reparations. In a tweet, Congresswoman Cori Bush added, black liberation in its totality must be prioritized. 
Others hope the holiday won't be a distraction. We need to focus on those things in addition to voting rights, in addition to reparations, as we celebrate this holiday. Back at the White House, a celebratory mood, tempered by the reality that hard work lies ahead for a nation still struggling to deliver racial justice. Great nations don't ignore their most painful moments. Juneteenth National Independence Day is the first new federal holiday in the United States since 1983, when the U.S. acknowledged Martin Luther King Jr. Day. Chris Reyes, CBC News, New York. In the face of turmoil inside her own Green Party tonight, Annamie Paul is again taking aim outside. The Prime Minister is not a feminist. He is not an ally. Ahead tonight at issue on why she's blaming the Liberals and what it could take to unite her party. But first... Congratulations on your second vote. Awesome. Inuit in Manitoba vaccinate their own, the big success of their small community clinics. Knowing that I would be surrounded by others that I know um, really helps. And are you going back to the office? I think I'll be at, the, at home probably two to three times a week. But could that come at a cost to your career? We're back in two. Welcome back. Starting next week in Ontario, anyone who had a first shot before May 9th will be able to book a second. And Premier Doug Ford says he wants to get Ontarians haircuts and more. I have five women in my house. Well, not my, my house, but five women that are on to me. They're, they're lobbying me hard. So are these manicures, pedicures, and, you know, everything else that they get done. Ford says he is pushing his chief medical officer of health to agree to a quicker move to phase two. But today, Ontario's chief medical officer of health urged caution. Another province, meanwhile, is opening faster than expected. Since we're allowed to stop in New Brunswick, it's a lot easier. It was a bit of a relief because now we no longer have to isolate, so that makes our move a lot easier. We just well, went for a ride. It's been, a, it's been almost a year. As of midnight last night, New Brunswick is open to all Canadians who have proof of a single dose of vaccine, and they don't have to quarantine. But that makes New Brunswick's border restrictions the loosest of the out-of-the-Atlantic provinces, and it complicates things for the other three. Um, unfortunately, uh, I was surprised that their risk tolerance is, is different. Nova Scotia will be open to other Atlantic provinces by Monday, but it isn't reopening to the rest of Canada until at least July 14th. The Premier says he is meeting with other Atlantic Premiers to work out how to track travelers' vaccine status when they cross borders. Manitoba's reopening plan hinges on vaccine uptake. More than 70% of the population has already had one dose, but officials say community clinics are key to pushing that figure higher, especially clinics devoted to those already marginalized, like the one Marina von Stackelberg is about to show us. Congratulations on your second dose. Awesome. A shot of hope for Bobby Taguna. It means he could soon go home to visit Nunavut. I feel much healthier than I did five minutes ago. A few chairs down, Jocelyn Purinen just got her dose too. Knowing that I would be surrounded by others that I know um, really helps. Like any other vaccine clinic, public health nurses dole out shots and the coveted sticker. But this room is much smaller than Winnipeg's vaccine super sites. At the Manitoba Inuit Association, a familiar place with familiar faces. Our staff here is all Inuk, so um, that makes a huge difference as well. <laughs> Janet Kanayuk runs the clinic. She's part of the province's growing Inuit population. They've moved from northern Canada for better access to opportunities, education and health care. But she says many indigenous services down here in the south aren't tailored to her culture. Inuit's often in the background and sort of forgotten about. Uh, we don't have a, a very large population compared to First Nations or Métis people. Um, so it's nice that we get to come here and we get to uh, be around our fellow Inuit. The Inuit Association has managed to get doses to hundreds of people. They provide childcare and transportation and combat vaccine misinformation. Clinic coordinator Janelle Samartuk encourages every Inuk she sees to get a shot. I've told people like my story of why I want to. Like I've lost people like in my family due to COVID and that's the reason why I got the vaccine and to protect myself and other people around me. 
Inuit have many historical reasons to be wary of government. They're a lot more comfortable knowing that if my fellow Inuk is okay with this, then it must be good. Getting information from their own community helps rebuild trust. Marina von Stackelberg, CBC News, Winnipeg. As more people are vaccinated and more restrictions lift, a lot of Canadians are looking ahead to what the new normal at work could look like. I think I'll be at, the, at home probably two to three times a week. But could choosing a more flexible schedule actually limit your career? But first, Rosie's here with that issue. Adrian, tonight we're going to talk more about the recent turmoil within the Green Party. I know you talked to Annamie Paul last night, but we're going to ask where this leaves her leadership. I say again that the Prime Minister is not a feminist. He is not an ally. Will this message unite her own party? Chantal, Andrew and Althea will join all of us right after the break. I say again that the Prime Minister is not a feminist, he is not an ally to undermine my leadership at this early stage in such a willful, craven way. That is not the kind of politics that people in Canada should want to see. They should want to see me in Parliament meeting him on the battlefield of ideas. I'm asking again uh, the Prime Minister uh, to back off and I'm telling him again that, uh, you know, he has reaped what he has, has sown and I want to know if he's, if he's happy. Okay, Green Party leader Annamie Paul defending her leadership again today, again calling out the Prime Minister, blaming him and the Liberals for the recent turmoil existing within her own party. Where does her leadership stand after this week? Can she unite her party moving forward? It's Thursday. I'm here with At Issue, Chantelle Bear, Andrew Coyne, and Althea Raj. Good to see everybody. Let's start, Althea, with you and on that point that Annamie Paul has made now for a couple of days that this is, has something to do with the Prime Minister and that he is somehow responsible for for what is happening here. Yeah, I think let's be clear, this has absolutely nothing to do with Justin Trudeau. Uh, Annamie Paul is like drowning and trying to grab at anything that uh, she can to diffuse blame. Uh, this is a problem, it seems, of her own making. And if she has, if there's any blame to go around, it should go around in her own party. It is completely natural for a party leader to want to try to poach MPs from other parties. We've seen that continuously. Even Elizabeth May did that. Yeah. Um, and so to have... Um, Annamie Paul stand there and say that this is somehow like Jane Philpott and Jody Wilson-Raybould is outrageous, frankly, and, and pretty rich. Uh, Andrew, your thoughts on that? Well, I mean, Justin Trudeau may be, as Ms. Paul charges, a fake feminist, but I'm not sure uh, working to uh, undermine opposition parties is evidence of that. That is the stuff, unfortunately, you might say, maybe we should have a higher-minded view of politics than that, but it's pretty standard fare. Uh, for political leaders to try to divide their opposition forces, to try to lure uh, other party MBs to cross to their ranks. That is, you know, pretty standard stuff of politics. Uh, so she does seem to be trying to kind of uh, raise the, 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 the stakes, if you will, on this beyond the specifics of this particular issue. Chantal. Well, if you're a feminist, I guess you wouldn't want to be suggesting that a female MP Jenica Atwin, not to name her, that decides to change parties, uh, has no will of her own and has been mm -hmm. what, hypnotized by a male prime minister. Uh, that doesn't sound terribly feminist to me to start with. Um, second, the, the moving on uh, and other comments to uh, Christia Freeland being just yes. some person that, uh, a token uh, person for the prime minister. It's not very feminist to go after accomplished women in other parties. It sounds to me like uh, Madame Paul is either not getting any real advice or not listening to it. Okay, so what, what, is, what is going on here beside the, you know, the issue of, of trying to blame someone else for the problems? How much is this uh, hurting Annamie Paul's leadership, Althea? Uh, it's hurting her leadership, and it's, frankly, it's hurting the party. Um, she says that she had a strong mandate, but the party was split. I mean, she basically only, she won on the eighth ballot with the 2,000 votes between her and the other candidate um, who represents a more militant part of the Green Party. And so already she kind of had a mountain to climb, but she was the favorite candidate of people like Elizabeth May. The bigger problem, I think, is that even those in her caucus don't see eye to eye with her on this Janica Atwin thing. 
They want her to, to love her back, to welcome her with open arms and basically to, to apologize. And Miss Paul is digging her heels in and refusing to say, even if she agrees with the content of what her assistant said, uh, just say that it wasn't an it was inappropriate for him yeah. to basically threaten sitting MPs. And she's still, you know, she's had two press conferences so far this week, and still she refuses to say that that was an inappropriate comment from her aide. Um, so I think until she does that, her promise will not go away. And, and Andrew, is this about it is difficult to lead the Green Party because the Green Party is not sort of what you might call traditionally <laughs> um, dealt with it the way other parties are? Or is this about Annamy Paul's ability to lead the party? I think there's fault on all sides. The, the, the party itself has a large faction within it that has, if I may say, wildly intemperate views on the Middle Eastern conflict, um, which they're entitled to, but uh, it's guaranteed to create ill feeling and, and division within the party. Sure. Uh, that was compounded by Ms. Paul's advisor then basically publicly threatening to, to unseat uh, the MPs who had voiced these expressions, uh, and it sort of, sort of you know, metastasized from there. On top of that, uh, there are the, there's, there's issues around uh, Ms. Paul's style of leadership. Now, she has accused her critics of um, mouthing sort of racist and sexist tropes of, quote, unquote, the angry black woman. And that's a fair charge, or can be. But what do you do if you have an individual in question who happens to be a high-handed autocratic, but is also a black woman? Do you just desist from making any criticism? Do you just back off and say any criticism is, is in and of itself uh, evidence of racism, sexism? I, you know, that's an open question. I think that's something the party is going to have to really wrestle with. Yeah, Chantal? Any chief of staff to any leader uh, that would put in writing threats against sitting MPs, and even more so for a party that has uh, worked really hard to work itself up to three seats, yeah. w would have been in another party fired. Uh, and, and because that is totally displaced. Staffers do not threaten elected uh, MPs with campaigning against them. Yes. How can that make any sense in any yeah. event? Yeah. Are you trying to clean up your caucus so you end up with zero in the House of Commons? Because that is where this leads. So that's the first problem. Uh, the second problem is that uh, there are many people who have been interested in the Green Party because of Elizabeth May and her mm -hmm. um, rather positive approach to politics. Right. and cooperative approach to politics. Those people are not interested in getting a, into an internal war over the Middle East uh, within the membership of the Green Party or watching the leaders settle scores. So what doesn't seem to be clear to uh, Madame Paul at this point is that people can just stay home or they can vote for other parties, but they don't yeah. or their vote. Yeah. And at this point, the messages she is sending is a turnoff for both her leadership and her party. Uh, so how much of this is to do with the fact that Elizabeth May led this party for 13 years, I think? And, and uh, you know, when you lose a leader after that period of time, especially when the leader sticks around, just to, decided not to do the job any, a, anymore, that it is hard for parties to become something else, you know, independent of what the leader was. I, I, you know, we saw that a little bit, I think, with the Conservatives, as Andrew Scheer tried to take over Stephen Harper's party. Althea, do you think that part of that is the challenge? challenge here? Uh, well, two things. I think, you know, back to her accusations that the party, um, that some of the councillors were displaying sexist and racist behavior um, yeah. towards her. And the challenge is that she says that she was being held to a different set of standard than the previous leader, Elizabeth May. Right. Regardless of what identities the next leader had, they were always going to be held to a different standard than Elizabeth May. Elizabeth May basically embodied the Green Party. The Green Party was Elizabeth May, and she had a lot of leeway for a party leader that was never going to exist in the, the new leader. Has Elizabeth May's presence in the House made Annamy Paul's life more difficult? Yes, perhaps. Um, Elizabeth May could have uh, given her seat to Annamy Paul, and Annamy Paul would have had an easier time in the House of Commons. She would have been a presence in the House of Commons, and she wouldn't have been living under Elizabeth May's shadow. Andrew? Uh, Ms. May was, let us recall, also uh, subject to a formal inquiry on charges of yes. bullying and harassment of her staffers. Mm -hmm. Uh, this is not an unknown charge against any leader. It's particularly not unknown within the Green Party, which has a particularly uh, um, takes a, 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 a dim view of uh, of high-handedness from the top. 
Uh, so that's, you know, that should be laid on the table as well. Um, I think she, like previous, like, some, like you mentioned Stephen Harper, I think you can be faulted for not preparing the ground for your succession, for not creating a lively uh, uh, leadership race to follow with strong contenders, with, uh, so that you create the sense that the party is more than just the individual who leads it. And I don't think she has succeeded very well on that ground. If I if I can just say though uh, yeah. that uh, Elizabeth made it uh, was not all of the Green Party. This is a party that has made significant inroads in Atlantic Canada at yes. the provincial mm -hmm. level, and that is why that defection really hurts the federal party because it does have credible people in the legislature in PEI in, in New Brunswick and. To have the only federal MP that is elected outside of Elizabeth May's sphere of influence defect to the Liberals sends a pretty powerful message that federally the party is not as serious as some of its provincial wings. It's a bit like the reform, the Canadian alliance, the Tories federally fighting uh, and provincial wings of the progressive conservative party not wanting to be stuck in that environment. Okay, got to leave it there. Thank you all. Appreciate it. Good conversation. Before we go, be sure to subscribe to At Issue, the podcast for extra content, including the panel's take on this one. It's more clear than ever that whatever the future holds for us, all of us, Quebec is a nation. You can find that on any major podcast app and on our website, cbcnews.ca slash The National. One more note, we do want to hear from you before at issue goes on a summer hiatus, well-deserved one. Send us your political questions at uh, the national at cbc.ca, on Instagram at cbcthenational, or on Twitter, of course. We'll put them to our favorite people <laughs> in the coming weeks. Now it's back to Adrian in Toronto. All right, Rosie, thank you. Ahead tonight, when restrictions lift, will you head back to the office or work from home? That choice could cost you. But first, a bloody chapter of Russia's history buried deep within a forest. The clue that led to the discovery. Next. Welcome back. Russia is reckoning with a bloody part of its history. The executions ordered by former Soviet leader Joseph Stalin. Now a museum is revealing new details about mass graves of the victims. Chris Brown has the story. Hidden under a vast green canopy, just 40 minutes from Moscow's Kremlin, the secrets of the ugliest chapter from Russia's 20th century are slowly being revealed in a forest near Komunarka. We need to remember these people whose lives ended here, said the Orthodox priest as he comforted the families of victims of Joseph Stalin's great terror. 75-year-old Natalia Skripnik's uncle and her mother's first husband were murdered by Stalin in the 1930s. His paranoia that he had enemies everywhere triggered more than one million executions. In my lifetime, nothing like this must ever be repeated. This burial site was top secret during communist times but later, Russia acknowledged there was a mass grave here. Many victims of Stalin's great terror simply disappeared in the middle of the night and their families had no idea where they ended up. In fact, Stalin's henchmen had them murdered and their bodies were brought here and dumped in this mass grave. There's at least 6,000 bodies here, but possibly many, many more. Recent archeological work has pinpointed 130 burial pits. Families have put up photographs, but it's not possible yet to say precisely whose remains are buried in each location. Galina Gatsinpina's mother's first husband, a doctor, was executed in 1938. I went around and kissed all of the trees. I thought this is where he was shot. I imagined they put him up against a tree and shot him. In a strange twist, it was actually a photo from a Nazi Luftwaffe flight in 1942 showing fresh mounds of dirt that helped lead archaeologist Mikhail Zukovsky identify specific graves. Russia's federal police, the FSB, still refuses to release all of its historical files, so crucial facts such as the real number of people murdered and buried here remain a mystery. Shouldn't they be shared? 
uh, well, of course, but the idea of uh, such institutions is uh, to keep it in secret and that's all. Worryingly, a growing number of Russians prefer to think of Stalin as a war hero rather than a butcher. Major galleries still feature him in prominent displays. Alexei Nesterenko lost his father to Stalin's purges. The new generation, the opinion polls show, they know nothing at all about repressions, he said, and half of the population of Russia, they excuse it. There's a new information center at the site with stories about the victims, a destination for future generations to understand the atrocities committed just outside of their city. Chris Brown, CBC News, Moscow. Are you ready to head back to the office? Well, the office will be ready for you. We're fully leased uh, with the first tower and we have a substantial pre-lease in place for the, for the second building. Many Canadians say they want to keep working from home, but your ambition may get in the way. That's next. I'm Jamie Poisson, and tomorrow on CBC's Daily News podcast, Front Burner, what the Biden-Putin summit says about the tense relationship between Russia and the U.S. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back. And by the way, there's a message for you. The office called and it wants you back. Ready or not, many Canadians will start heading to their regular workplaces. And a lot of companies say they will let employees work from home at least some of the time. But as Diane Buckner explains, that hybrid model may have a downside. Carlos Sayo is happy with his home office setup. It cuts down the commute time, that's for sure. So, um, you know, you do have sort of more hours in your day. He had been hesitant to take advantage of the workplace flexibility his employer offered prior to the pandemic, but now he's on board in a big way. I think I'll be at, the, at home probably two to three times a week. Working from home has proven to be incredibly popular. Statistics Canada says 80% of those surveyed say they would like to work at least half of their hours from home once the pandemic is over. But that doesn't mean all offices will only be half full. We're fully leased uh, with the first tower and we have a substantial pre-lease in place for the, for the second building. This brand new 3 million square foot development in Toronto is attracting plenty of tenants with amenities such as a fancy food court and a gym. That's what people don't necessarily have when they're working at home. Business is a team sport and it's difficult to play with only part of the team. But this CEO says employees who opt to work from home, even part time, could find it a career limiting move. There's the old saying 90% of success is showing up. An American study of career success at a U.S. tech firm, pre-COVID, found that the more often someone worked from home, the less likely they were to see pay increases. We are competing for rewards, a limited amount of promotions and salary increases. And there is a stigma associated with using flexible work practices. I think the professional... Carlos Sayo has no worries about how working from home may affect his career. I think we'll all be on a level playing field regardless of, um, you know, how often each individual uh, comes into the office. He says the pandemic proved people can be productive anywhere, and he hopes that stigma against working from home is outdated. Diane Buckner, CBC News, Toronto. Next, an unusual rescue on one of Ontario's busiest highways. A llama, yes, on the lamb, the moment right after the break. Well, this was a bit of an odd call for police in Ontario. A llama just appearing to make its way onto a busy highway north of Toronto. How the officers safely reeled in the animal and reconnected it with its family, that's tonight's moment. We got a call just after six o'clock for a llama running in the lanes of the southbound Highway 400. I can tell you in 18 years of working, I've never heard a call for a llama on the highway before. So something out of the ordinary. And we were able to use our vehicles to box the llama in, but they're quick and they're fast. It was like a, a running back in a football game. So uh, we waited for a horse trailer to come and to take it back to where it came from. Here we are not doing a car chase. We're not chasing a bad guy. We're chasing a llama, which is a 
not a typical animal you would find in Southern Ontario. And it could be something that could be serious, but in, in this situation, it turned into something that we'll talk about for years. So this is not only a bold llama, it's a pretty smart one too. Apparently its owner took it to an animal clinic and as soon as the vet, you know, turned away to do something, the llama made a break for it. Keep your eye on the llama. That is a national for June 17th. Good night.